Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be starting just shortly. Um, we will be live streaming, so those that are out in the hinterlands, feel free to either uh, tweet to Aspen Ascend, or actually you can email your questions and comments. So, And now I'm going to introduce uh, Roxanne White. She's the Morgridge family. Um, innovator in residence for Ascend at the Aspen Institute. And I, I should have introduced myself. I'm Marjorie Sims. I'm the managing director at Ascend. And so thank you all for being here. And Roxanne will be here in just a second, and then we'll start. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. And on behalf of the Ascend team, we are honored to have so many people in the audience and on the live stream from throughout the country. And we particularly want to welcome the people who are live streaming in groups from places like Hawaii uh, to Florida to all of our Ascend fellows and, of course, to all of our colleagues um, who are also uh, tuning in um, from Colorado. And as Marjorie mentioned a moment ago, I'm Roxanne White, the Morgridge Family Foundation Innovator in Residence at Ascend, um, as well as an Ascend Fellow. And I am honored to introduce the panelists and my esteemed colleague, Eric Motley, today from the Aspen Institute. If you're not familiar with Ascend at the Aspen Institute, you should be. Um, we are the national hub for breakthrough ideas and collaborations that move children and adults in their lives to educational success, economic security, health, and well-being. We take a two-generation approach to our work, focusing on children and the adults in their lives together. And we bring a gender and racial equity lens to our analysis. In everything we do, we draw on the expertise and experience of families. And today, we are kicking off our solution series with leaders from Colorado. And on June 1st, we will be in Tennessee with Governor Haslam kicking off some solutions that are happening in Tennessee. We will have publications following um, throughout the summer on state-to-state -state strategies, followed by a fatherhood summit in the fall. And so we are delighted to have you here today at this inaugural event. And now to our panelists. I've had the good fortune of working with all of them. <laughs> and you have official bios in front of you. And you are welcome to please read them and please also look at the materials today, which is a start of our solution series. But I want to tell you about them as leaders and in, as people and what I know about them. Governor Hickenlooper is one of the most transformative leaders in America with a passion for business and for families. He knows that having a great business climate and attracting businesses only works when a state is also a great place to be a parent and a great place to raise a child. He has fully embraced a two-gen approach at looking at solutions for the entire family. And if you don't know this about him, he is a geologist who became a very reluctant politician after being a business owner. 
And as mayor of Denver, he created and expanded the Denver Preschool Program. He founded the Denver Scholarship Foundation. And he took those same values to being governor, where he expanded access to early childhood education and college access, while at the same time ensuring that Colorado was the most business-friendly place to grow a, a business. And he attracted Fortune 500 companies and never once did he look at a family and an employer being in competition, but instead being collaborative partners together, knowing well that good employees are also good parents. And it is a delight to have him here today. And if you haven't read his book, he's also an author and recently wrote um, his bi biography, The Opposite of Woe, My Life in Beer and Politics. <laughs> Welcome, Governor Hickenlooper. Reggie Bika is also here, and he is the executive director of the Colorado Department of Human Services and a member of the inaugural class of Ascend Fellows. And I had the honor of working with Reggie when he was leading his cabinet peers to adopt strategies that would support children and families together, a two-gen approach. He revolutionized access to supports and data tracking of outcomes in conjunction with the Colorado counties. He transformed child support so that fathers became back engaged, not just financially with their children, but emotionally with their children. He's worked with Ascend to broaden the leadership for children and families throughout Colorado. He is a tireless advocate for children and families together. He's inspiring, kind, and an outcome-focused leader, and we are delighted to have Reggie with us today. And the panel will be moderated by Ann Mosley. Ann is the Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of Ascend. And if you don't know Ann, what I will tell you about Ann is that she is a visionary. And she is the founder of Ascend, and she has a laser focus on solutions that move low-income children and their parents toward education success and economic security. Her leadership with Ascend Fellows, with convenings of policymakers, philanthropists, businesses, <clears throat> elected and appointed leaders, has led to quantum leaps to help break the cycle of poverty. Recently, she launched the Two Generation Innovation Fund, a national network focused on promising programs and policy innovations. Anne's energy and vision for children and families together is contagious and her expertise and insights will become readily apparent as she facilitates the panel. It is now my honor to introduce my colleague, Eric Motley, who is the Executive Vice President and Corporate Secretary for the Aspen Institute, where he is responsible for institutional advancement and government. And Eric is an inspirational leader, and one of the joys of working at the Aspen Institute is when Eric comes around and talks to staff because he is inspiring, he is values-centered um, and grounded, and he is a terrific human being who has also been instrumental in supporting 2Gen. And as my mother would say, he recently authored one of the best books around called Madison Park, A Place of Hope. Thank you. Eric? Thank you. She read the script just as I wrote it. <laughs> Two books are for sale afterwards, the governor's <laughs> and mine. I hope you feel most welcome to the Aspen Institute. Uh, we were founded, I don't know if you know much about the history of the Aspen Institute, but we were founded nearly 70 years ago. And there's a question mark, in 1945 was when a Chicagoan decided to go to the great state of Colorado to retreat and to find some time to reflect. But it was not until 1949 that he decided to invite a whole group of friends to engage with him in a great American conversation. <coughs> this was during those post-war years. And he brought together not only academicians who sat in the academy and thought about these complex ideas in society, but he brought people who were close to the ground, working and trying to find solutions. And that was the beginning of the Aspen Institute. And it was driven by this great Aristotelian idea of what is a good society? And what role do we all play in helping to quicken the making of the good society? And so for nearly 70 years, we've been bringing people together from all across different sectors and political ideologies and backgrounds and working on the most important issues, the most critical issues that we face in society, all with the end goal of trying to find viable solutions, to test those solutions, to identify strong and viable strategies. 
And so a part of that great history has been to look at issues like equ inequity and poverty. And so when Anne brought her great idea, we're all about great ideas here, <laughs> in 2010 to the Aspen Institute to create this hub so that we could look at these two generation issues and try to bring people together in a hub to find viable solutions, it was a part of an ongoing commitment that we've made from our start to try to come up with solutions to address these important issues. So I hope you feel at home as you're a part of a conversation that's been going on for a very long time. And I'd like to thank you for your commitment and the voices that you bring to this conversation as we try to move the ball forward. We're at a very interesting inflection point again in Aspen's history. Walter Isaacson, our CEO, after 14 years is retiring. And we have a new president, Dan Porterfield, who's currently the president of Franklin and Marshall College, who will be starting in June. And his commitment to poverty and inequity is stellar. And so I know that the work that we're doing in this area will be elevated and quickened even more. And so even though we're based here in Washington, DC, we're founded in Colorado. <laughs> and so Reggie, thank you for serving on this panel. And great to have you as a colleague. And Governor, it's always a pleasure to have you on an Aspen Institute stage. Thank you for all that you do and for moving the conversation from thought to action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And um, I am Anne on the panel, Reggie and the governor. Um, Director Bika, sorry. Uh, <laughs> one of the things building on my wonderful colleague, um, Eric Motley's, whoopsie. That's okay. It's all good. Thank you so much. We're all good. Um, so thinking about sort of the early days of the Aspen Institute and really being in the right conversation um, for our society, one of the things we like to say that is very Aspenian, if you will, is having the right people at the right time for the right conversation. And I think building from our very early roots in Colorado back to Aristotle, there is nothing more important than making sure that opportunity can pass from one generation to the next. And one of the things that I think for us, um, and specifically that brought me to the Aspen Institute, um, certainly was um, inspired by the vision of Walter Isaacson and the history of the Aspen Institute. But at that time, about eight years ago, it was the first time that we saw research that said that Americans across gender, geography, and generation did not think that it was going to be better for the next generation. And that was such a mortal blow to what is the American psyche and what it sort of defines us in this country, that things will be better if you sort of work hard, play by the rules, and both give and give back. And I am a wholehearted believer in the potential of all people from all backgrounds. Um, and how do we really make sure we have the just and fair society that is going to allow us to reach our full potential? Because that will make us the strongest democracy, economy, and community, and having children and families at the center. So um, with that said, when we embarked on this work, we went very deep uh, about five, six, seven years ago um, to look at the action in the states. Because in Washington, and it's great in this room that we have folks, I see leaders from the federal government, from the Hill, from partner organizations, from grassroots organizations. And Governor, we have folks, again, from Hawaii, Mississippi, New York that are having office parties and community conversations listening into this. Because there's such a robust energy to see the action about what can happen at the state level. States are where decisions and investments transform lives. They build pathways. They create systems that allow people to reach their full potential. They're also when decisions are a little bit closer to home and accountability can be even a little bit more powerful. So we have from the beginning really thought about how do you look for and lift up innovations at the local and state level. And so it's no surprise that the first state that really helped lead the way is the great state of Colorado. Um, I think Governor Hickenlooper, you said once that if you ever want to find out where you're made from or what you can be, Colorado's the state to figure that out. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I mean, when we think about the state of Colorado, it was the first state to recognize women's right to vote, 19, I mean, 20, almost 25 years before it was ratified the 19th Amendment. 
Um, Colorado was one of the first states to really think about and understand, both with the private sector, the return on investment of investing in children and families early and early childhood. Um, it has building it one of the strongest durable economies across the state. Every time you get off that plane, you see something else popping up. The only thing we can't root for are the Rockies. Um, <laughs> that season is open. Um, and when we think about federal state partnerships, it's been really thrilling to see whether it's everything from the early learning challenge grants um, that I think Colorado is recognized as probably one of the strongest federal investments of how that was put to work to also the very highly competitive um, Department of Labor de um, innovation grants around strengthening working families at Aurora Community College. So there's so many more, but I just pulled those out because they've been really at the heart of some federal leading investments that had a two-gen lens. Um, so you know, with that said, I mean, it's time to sort of jump into the conversation. And um, having the chance to work with Governor Hickenlooper, who is a, kind of in the twilight season of a very stellar, um, uh, as long as you can go, service in the state of Colorado in that role, um, and working with the wonderful director, uh, Reggie Bika. And I think the fact that they're both on the stage is a, is a testament to leadership that the role of a governor to build the, you know, to set the vision, set the course, but really partner and create a culture throughout your administration about eye on the prize and how to move forward and how to move forward collaboratively. And so with that in mind, I'd love to just kick it off with, you know, it's been a remarkably, remarkable eight years for Colorado. When you came in, great recession, housing crisis, unemployment, a lot of stuff um, that was not necessarily described as um, a tailwind. Um, I'd love for you to talk about how Colorado has changed for children and families since um, you really entered the stage uh, in this formal role um, in 2010. Well, first, thank you for, for having the two gen idea, or at least bringing it to the Aspen Institute. Uh, and I always want to recognize Roxanne White, who I worked with uh, for the better part of a, almost a decade and a half. Uh, and has, you know, one of the great managers, leaders that I've ever worked with, for sure. Um, and uh, I don't know where Eric went to the way back. <laughs> I bow down to Eric. <laughs> and I, I, just for the record, I read my book. Oh, that's right, I wrote my book. I read his book. His book is a lot better, just so you know. It, it is a, a reflection on life and, and, and how communities thrive and what love of place really is about. Um, it's, uh, a wonderful work. So, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit, but I'm really going to not talk too much because one of the few things I'm really good at, I'm good at a lot of stuff, but I'm really good at, at hiring really talented people. That's something I'm, I'm most proud about. And uh, for me to wax on too long would be, uh, would, would be malpra governmental malpractice. <laughs> uh, we came in. I got elected uh, and took office. In, I got elected in 2010. Took uh, office in 2011. We were 40th in job creation. Unemployment was, you know, in the bottom uh, bottom half of the country, uh, and we really focused from the very beginning on how we're going to create jobs and and how do we get rid of red tape and regulation, but also make Colorado a place known as pro business. And part of this was having a, a chief of staff like Roxanne, who is not just a great manager. I mean, she has, she's read more business books than I've ever even looked at the covers. And yet her master's is not in business management. Her, she has a master's in divinity. So the moment we started talking about jobs and, and job creation and how we're gonna be the most pro-business state, but with the highest ethical standards, the highest environmental standards, the highest uh, family standards, she was from the beginning saying, well, you're never gonna have a strong economy if you don't have a strong uh, community uh, that supports uh, children in poverty and, and, and families in poverty, because you can't look at one without the other. And she saw that right from the beginning. Uh, even back then, we worked at the city of Denver on a campaign to end homelessness that had been uh, very successful. And we really recognized that, all right, if we're going to take a two-gen approach, I mean, clearly the, the, the best you know, the, the best thing we can do to support the economy is to have an economy where, uh, or an environment where people want to live there. And if people want to come live there, you've got, you, get, you need good schools, you need good health care, you need all the, the basic infrastructure uh, that many of us take for granted. But if you're a single parent and you're trying to work and raise children at the same time, 
uh, it's not taken for granted. And the complexity of that is, is spectacular. And I had, I was guilty coming in as of always speaking, thinking of it in a binary system, right? We're gonna focus on these kids. We're gonna, in, in Denver, we were the first city to pass a, a, a sales tax to, to make sure that we had universal early childhood education. Every four-year-old would have access to quality early childhood education. Thank you. <laughs> it was a battle, right? It was a long battle. Uh, but but there, were, there were bonuses for the, for the independent objective measurement of quality in these, uh, in these early childhood education centers. I mean, to this day, a great success. We, and we want to motivate kids in school to work hard, so we created the Denver Scholarship Foundation. We did all these things. Uh, but we, we, we were doing the work, at least I was thinking of the work that we were doing, that we're not, we hired Reggie, and Reggie was not raised in Colorado, just so you're clear, I stole him from Wisconsin. <laughs> it's, it's, that is the other thing that governors are happy to do. There's a, there's a thing I call enlightened larceny. <laughs> and, and, and it can be either, it can be either policy or it can be talent. Uh, and in Reggie's case, it was talent. He'd been a very innovative uh, and imaginative uh, head of their uh, uh, off of, off of uh, human resources uh, of, of oh, what, am I, the, what would you call it? Children and families. Children and families. I, I knew I knew that it had a a, a hip modern name. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and they were already uh, uh, you know building that foundation by which you do look at it at a two gen solution because if you're not addressing the issues around the parents, you're never going to succeed with the kids, and vice versa. If the kids if you're not working with the kids uh, in, in, in harmony with what you're doing with parents, uh, the parents aren't going to be successful. And that was a basic premise of, of really what we started. And uh, I'm not going to, I'll let Reggie talk about all the stuff we did. I do, I do think it's worth pointing out that we did become a, a, an awful lot of what we, the, what we got known for. You know, US News and World Report just came out for the second year with the number one economy in America. But what you don't hear about is all the innovation in, 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 uh, in social services and how we provide the support to two-gen families to make sure that everybody has a, has a hopefully an increasingly available shot at, at, at achieving their own version of the American dream. And Reggie's done a, a remarkable. Now, Reggie also has a tendency sometimes to be blunt with sometimes legislators. And so we have had to do some little bit of. So glad you brought that up, Governor. That's sometimes, really... sometimes we've had to take the shovel out of his hand to tell him not to quite dig quite so fast. Um, anyway, Reggie, why don't you talk a little bit about about all the work you've done? Sorry. So uh, those of you who've not met Governor Hickenlooper before, this is what you get on the stage and off the stage: <laughs> smart, visionary, funny committed to moving things forward. And uh, when I came to Colorado uh, almost eight years ago, it was the governor in Rocks who laid out a vision of um, not only do we have to dig our state out of the recession that we were in in 2011, but we couldn't stop there. We had to have a bigger future about changing systems uh, and changing the lives for so many Coloradans who can't take advantage of even a good economy. Um, the governor mentioned that today we have uh, one of the most robust economies in the country. What he didn't tell you is that because of investments around healthcare and making certain that all Coloradans are healthy, uh, we have about 94% or so, 93, 94% of all Coloradans covered. 97% of all children in our state uh, are covered by health insurance. Our unemployment rate, <laughs> our unemployment rate hovers around uh, 3%. Our, uh, the, the, uh, Children living in poverty has declined from a high of 18% down to 13% as recently as 2016. I suspect it's a bit lower if we could get an accurate count today. We have more kids from low-income families participating in high-quality child care. These are the types of things that we've been able to do because the governor laid out a vision and set expectations that wasn't about just government solving problems, but bringing the entire community together throughout the state to solve problems. Excellent. And we should throw in that part of what we do is try and take down the silos. So when we taught, began implementing 2Gen in a systemic way within the state government, we actually have work groups. That, so we now have 2Gen approaches in 10 different state agencies. Yeah. 
which is incredibly powerful. And just kind of riffing on the two pieces here, I think one of the pieces where you know, we are actively working with a cohort of about 15 states that are red, blue, and purple that have been sort of embracing this two-gen approach. And one of the things that I think has been an amazing um, leadership quality at the uh, governor level have been, um, and Governor Hickenlooper, you've led the way, um, along with other colleagues like Governor Hassan to sort of really dig into things like human services, which is a $2 billion lever that sometimes is not the front page unless there's something going wrong. And to think proactively about human services innovation is really phenomenal. And then to bring that across from your other colleagues in different agencies and just watching how that has unfolded after you were enlightenedly stolen from Wisconsin has been <laughs> has been a model for many for many others. And so I've, I've kind of you know sort of going to the next level. You know you've you've just you know you're an entrepreneur, a geologist, uh, a beer craft um, lover and producer, and also a governor. When you think about the, the challenges and the opportunities in setting the lofty goal that making Colorado the best place for parents and families, thinking about the future of work, a growing economy, um, the economic conditions, and then things like quality childcare and, and an ever sort of pace of 24 seven work schedules. Um, you know, talk about that vision and what you're proud of what you've accomplished, what are some of the things still on your mind in this space around two gen and for parenting and work? Well, I think that the, the best, the, the, the most successful exit of poverty, the most, the most efficient tool against poverty is, is better jobs, right? And figuring out how you get people paid more money and make sure that they are more continuously employed, that they're not having to try and get by on 30 hours a week, that they can have a, a, you know, a full-time job. Uh, and we put a great deal of effort on that, a, a great deal of effort into that. Uh, we're not there yet. But we can. We are beginning to see some real improvement and some uh, some increase in wages across the across the board. One of the real key issues there is that if people are going to be able to uh, improve their potential earnings down the road, they have to have the support to to acquire more skills. And you know, we push back. Everyone always is telling everyone t telling. I have for years told everyone, got to get the college degree, you got to go to college. You know, 70% of our kids mm -hmm. are never going to get a four year degree, no matter how hard we try. This has been plus or minus 3% has been true for 30 years. And those 70% of our kids, we've basically been telling them, in essence, that they're second class, they're not good enough. And at the same time, we've been, you know, psychologically diminishing them. We've also been reducing resources by which we provide skills training that allows them to come in and, 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 and be able to better themselves. And this happens not just in, in high school, but continues through their lives. And one of the things we're really pushing very hard on is to say, A, are these skills training opportunities available to all people, no matter where they live, no matter what their economic uh, circumstances are, but does everyone have an equal shot at, at these skills? And then do they have the supports? Do they have childcare? Right? Are they able to take time off from work? Are they, are they not having to work 60 hours uh, a week to be able, because you know, if you're working 50 or 60 hours a week to support your family, you just don't have time to, to, to acquire new skills. And, and you're going to be in, you know, it's going to be a rat race. You're going to be in a hamster wheel for, for, for year after year after year uh, until we can figure out that way to, to get you those skills. And the, the notion that automation is going to eliminate all jobs, certainly it's going to change jobs and, and it will eliminate, you know, they, some people estimate half the jobs in America are repetitive, sufficiently repetitive that either automation, artificial intelligence, that they will eliminate the jobs. But I can guarantee you we are creating jobs at an equal or even faster rate, but there are different skills they're going to need. And that is a trick. We have to make sure we have a system whereby single parents are going to be able to have a time, a chance to acquire those skills. People that are working in a profession that we can already see that that their that profession is going to be eliminated in the next five years. I mean, bank tellers. I mean, a robot is now they've got we've got three different banks in Colorado that are test piloting no bank tellers in their bank, and they're cheaper, they're more accurate, they you know voice recognition. Uh, that's going to continue to happen, but someone's going to be a technician for those those robots. Someone's going to be servicing those robots. They need specific skills, and right now we didn't, we're not getting out in front of it, making sure that the people that are losing their jobs 
are getting the skills before their job is lost, right? And that's a whole thing. One of the big things we've learned about Tujan is that interruptions in employment can be uh, can set people back years uh, in terms of making progress, built, you know, working their way out of poverty. Yeah, no, that, and um, that's actually good, Reggie. I want to come back to engaging the private sector in a little bit, but Reggie. Um, you know, kind of be curious where in your agency you're overseeing childcare, the, you know, one of the first offices of early learning, bringing that all together with the two gen lens, and also workforce um, temporary assistance for needy families. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit, building on the governor's remarks there, what you're seeing in this bringing work and strong families and, you know, quality supports for kids coming together, the, both the opportunities, the progress and breakthroughs, and maybe even still some of the bumps? Absolutely. So, you know, um, the, the, there's only one, there's really two ways out of poverty, I believe, for most families. One is to win the lottery. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often, but technically, I guess that would be one. But the second is through a job. And I think that sometimes we spend too much time as a country debating about uh, whether or not people should work or, or get benefits and what that means. And the vision that we've created in Colorado is there's only a way out of poverty. We want more folks in our state to move out of poverty, but getting a job isn't enough. It's about getting a good paying job, and it's about having the skills and ability to stay in that job for the long haul or to advance throughout a career. And that really has been a vision for us uh, about as our economy is improving, how do we make certain that more Coloradans, particularly Coloradans that have uh, parents who have children, get access to uh, an, an education uh, whether that means finishing that GED or high school diploma or going on to earn a certificate or get an advanced degree so that they have the skills to get into their jobs. But at the same time, making certain that we uh, are focused on investing in their kids just like those parents want to do. And working hard to make certain that we have more kids who can get access to high quality childcare throughout the state. One of the biggest challenges that we experience for young children in our state is the achievement gap. Uh, children who come from uh, Latino families and from African American families uh, are way behind in their school readiness, way behind in their graduation rates from high school, uh, are behind uh, Caucasian students for their, likely, for their ability to get into college, the chances of getting into college. We know that through a two-gen lens, if we can be investing in those young children, helping them to be ready for kindergarten, and simultaneously investing in their parents to be uh, stronger parents and ready for the workforce, those folks are going to have a much better chance of succeeding in our economy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, with, I'm going to um, stick with you on this next question and then um, pass it over to the governor. Is So Colorado is 64 counties in a local control um, state. Um, and you have rural, suburban, and urban. You've got red, blue, and purple. You've got a lot of um, can-do minds out there. And I, I'd love to hear sort of, you know, and Reggie, you, you both of you, it's a sort of send the culture, the wonderful culture of um, Colorado. Now, can you talk about how you've worked with counties and what's their interest and eagerness around this? Re Reggie loves this system, just for the record. So he <laughs> lo loves having total local control in the counties. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the system, actually. I think it's. Uh, I think there's so many advantages to having a county administered system. Uh, Lee Iacocca, remember him, Chrysler guy back in the '80s. For millennials, he 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 actually ran. Chrysler Corporation back in the 1980s. He had commercials on when I was a kid, and he used, he used to say, you, when you're a leader, you need to lead, follow, or get out of the way. Well, I think about that in the work that I do with uh, county human service agencies in our state. There's times that we have to provide leadership. We created a program called CSTAT, where we can measure outcomes across about 100 different measures in our agency, and we're very data-driven, a, a value of the governor, to look into where problems are happening and, and use data to help us identify challenges and, and solve them. Uh, and then there are times when uh, we need to follow. Uh, many of you in the room know of Lynn Johnson, who's the Director of Human Services in Jefferson County and is uh, President Trump's appointee to be Assistant Secretary of the Administration for Children and Families. She and folks in her community created a program called the Jeffco Prosperity Project, where they're blending together Head Start with K-12 education, with uh, community and social services with employment and a commitment to help those children from Head Start and their families simultaneously 
all the way through the lifespan until those kids graduate from high school. We want to follow that. And then there's times where you just get out of the way. Jeff Coor is the director of uh, public health in Mesa County, and he's taken on the issue of childcare access. Mesa County is on the western side of Colorado, right on the Utah border. And uh, he created a program. He's also a Colorado fellow, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he cre he's creating a program called Child Care 8000, where he is working with uh, businesses and uh, other leaders in his community to create 8,000 new child care slots that he knows are not only critical for helping parents have a safe place, uh, a healthy place, and an educational place for their children while they're at work, he sees it as an economic driver because businesses will be more likely to settle in the Grand Junction area if they know that there's a workforce base that has a location for their kids to go during the day. That's great examples. And you know, Governor, building on that, you know, you're sort of where you're seeing the innovations happening across from rural and urban and 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 thinking about also you've been sort of one of your hallmarks has been how to bring cross-sector leadership. Philanthropy has really stepped in, up in Colorado it, from what we see across states at an unprecedented level because of the environment that's there now to partner with the public sector that wasn't there before in really effective concrete ways. And so I'd love to just sort of hear, you know, bring your thoughts in around both the local innovation, but then also the cross-sector partnership. So, and I am a big believer that the only lasting significant social change that occurs is when you bring together uh, the government business, and then what I call civil society, right? The, the nonprofits, the, the, the foundations. Foundations often provide us the venture capital. They're willing to go out and spend significant sums of money where we can't, we can't take that risk for fear of the, the political vengeance that is often uh, required when things don't work out. Uh, so a lot of the issues around um, housing, um, education, uh, when we did when we did the early childhood education program, the Denver preschool program, uh, we spent 30 months with a number of business leaders, nonprofit leaders, and and uh, and foundation leaders. We had two different groups of about 85, 90 people that met uh, almost all, all almost 12 times a year, almost monthly, uh, and then we came up with a consensus and went to the ballot and passed, you know, a pretty significant tax to to, to do this. But having business and nonprofits and, and, uh, and government working together, government really as a convener, was amazingly powerful. We did the same thing uh, with the Buffett Foundation. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to say that for several years, but then it got printed out in newspapers, so now I can feel <laughs> the Susan, Susan Buffett Foundation uh, gave us a little over $5 million a year uh, that allowed us to, uh, when, when young women were, uh, uh, getting health care, uh, we're able. We were able to advise them first. If you're a teenager, you shouldn't be having sex. You're not old enough. It's not a good idea. But if you are going to have sex, don't compound one bad decision with another one. And we made available at a very reduced cost, or in most cases free. We did this through uh, 29 clinics across the state. We, we we had a variety of partners in the nonprofit world. Uh, again, a classic public-private partnership. But we reduced the, the, the number of teenage pregnancies by over 60% in, in seven years and reduced the number of teenage abortions by over 70%. Uh, and that was a collaborative effort, right, using that, you know, using foundations. And once the, the Buffett Foundation was very explicit that, that this was not ongoing funding, once we could demonstrate the efficacy, and as you can imagine, the savings in cost by letting young women be able to you know, begin a family when they're ready and when, when they're planning, the, the, the savings in, in cost to uh, social services is, human services is immense. Uh, and it, actually the politics did get in, it took us two years to actually get yeah. permanent funding uh, outside of the philanthropic funding. Uh, but now it's part of the, you know, the ongoing uh, infrastructure of our healthcare system. Yeah, that's fantastic. It, it is a truly a national model that is results innovation and a public-private partnership. And I was thinking another great one is some of the work that you've done around the COPEP program, sort of really rethinking uh, child support and child enforcement in a way that it was truly an innovation model that sort of changed, was a game changer in terms of results, if you would like to talk a little bit about that one as well. Absolutely. So uh, child support, and this really came from 
listening to parents in our child support system, both uh, those who need to receive uh, financial assistance as well as those who have an obligation to pay. And if you talk to those who are responsible to pay child support, many uh, of those folks, particularly those who don't have an ability to pay, they would, they would tell me things like, um, when I go to court, I, I'm disrespected and I feel threatened like I'm in trouble. Uh, they tell me, um, I, I just got out of jail and I can't got all I can do to get any job and I don't really have the skills to get a job. I'm homeless, I don't know where I'm gonna sleep tonight. How can I come up with resources to be able to pay my child support? Uh, and then we wonder why they might work under the table for cash so that we can't track the child support system. So we've been testing with four counties in Colorado uh, and uh, uh, with a demonstration project uh, from the Administration on Children and Families, a different way of, of doing child support. This is, you know, for those who have an ability to pay, garnishing their wages, intercepting their taxes, taking their driver's license, all of those sorts of things are incredibly powerful and wonderful tools. We need them, but they are, they are insufficient for the entire population. So we created this program called the Colorado Parent Employment Program, and we said, what happens if we uh, develop a relationship with the parent who has a responsibility to pay, but isn't paying, a case manager? They tell us, um, maybe I don't have a relationship with my child. Well, what if we can help them connect an, a better relationship with the custodial parent, usually, most frequently mothers, but not always, uh, and develop a relationship with the child? What if we help them develop skills and get connected to the labor force? What if we help them with their mental health or substance abuse issues or give them parenting skills? What we found is that those folks, and we're doing a, a randomized control study, but those folks who have participated in our group, after 12 months, 76% of them continue to be employed. These are folks who were not employed the quarter before they started uh, the program that we've created. What we found is that these folks are more likely to pay their child support on time than their control group. What we found is that 38% uh, of the folks had paid nothing in child support the quarter before, that reduced to 19% uh, of people not paying child support after they entered the program. And lastly, we saw that uh, I believe it was 78% or so of the, of the folks in this program reduced their utilization or eliminated completely their use of public assistance benefits, Medicaid, uh, food assistance, et cetera. The part that's really compelling is when you sit down and you talk to the custodial parent, you talk to the non-custodial parent, and you talk to the child. And inevitably, tears well up in their eyes because they have figured out a way to communicate, to get along, to co-parent, and all, everyone in the family is lifted up and doing better uh, as a result of this way of engaging with non-custodial parents. That's great. Um, and you know, I just think this is emblematic of the kind of work we're looking to see of best and next practice about where you're sort of flipping the script a bit, but also really keeping your eye on the results and both having a vision, but a real practicality to what you're, what you're going, the change you're going about um, to make happen. And sort of along those lines, I, I, I think uh, Colorado was very successful in being selected to be part of a national initiative with the National Governors Association, which, um, of course, Ascend at the Aspen Institute was delighted to be um, a partner in. And um, I was, as I was listening to both of you, um, going back to the, the, the kind of really the first and most robust statewide two-gen summit um, that brought folks together and thinking about the panel that was with parents. And um, in the design, you had a panel of parents, and then you, I think it was about five of your cabinet directors listening first to the parents and then going on stage. And I was just sort of thinking, Reggie, kind of stepping back, um, you sharing it so well through the co-prep program, but thinking about from the tenure of the beginning of the Hickenlooper administration and all the work you and your wonderful team have been doing, how has listening to the voices really, what does that take? What does that mean? What's that shift look like? And then, you know, as your love of democracy, how, you know, sort of bringing family and community voice into this. Well, and the summit. And also bring in the energy a little bit of that summit. I'd love for both of you because I think other states would be very interested in that. 
Uh, it takes intentionality to find the time to make the time. It takes uh, finding a, a spot uh, or spots or times or opportunities that are safe and make sense for our families to, to come in. And third, it takes active listening to, to hear and then respond in real ways to uh, parents who are telling us their stories, taking the chance to open up to us and let us know what happened. Um, one of the things that came out of the, the conference that you're talking about is an initiative between higher education, county agencies, the de our State Department of Human Services, and the community college uh, down in what's called the San Luis Valley, which is in the southern part of our state, Colorado, where we've put together a partnership that's building on using McVie funds, building on home visitation programs, housing, human and social services, and folks getting into the community college system. And we're trying to see if we can, by just connecting the dots, not throwing more money at this, but just getting the systems to work together in a common collaborative way, can we increase the likelihood that parents will complete their degree, whatever it is that they're working on at the community college, that they'll continue and complete uh, home visitation, that their children will be more, like, more prepared for kindergarten, and that they get connected to the labor force than if we have all of those systems in place, but they're not connected and working together in a way that makes sense for our families. Stay tuned for the results of that one. <laughs> um, and I'll chime in with the one when Reggie was talking about uh, the importance of support pay payments and making sure that fathers have that opportunity to participate in the, in the rearing of their children. I thought, think, and I've heard now two specific stories of uh, young men who were uh, uh, felons and had served their time in prison. Uh, and uh, one of them had come out twice before, reoffended, gone back, uh, obviously never made support payments of any sort. But for them, <clears throat> once they were able to hold a job down uh, and, and, and actually continue in the support of their, uh, of their, of their family, their kids, and the Custodial parent, which I hate that word, custodial parent. I mean, that's let's to, before we leave this room, let's <laughs> figure out the right terminology for that. Right. But but anyway, for them, the, the, it was like a light going on. By reestablishing the payments, they had risen up enough in their own self-esteem to rebuild their, you know, to reach out and connect again with their kid. And you know, I don't know how you measure the, the value of that. Sometime right. we'll have a longitudinal study that will be able to go down and look at the savings from that. But I mm -hmm. guarantee you it will dwarf yeah. almost anything else we talk about. Um, and so anyway, parents and children thriving together was the, the, what the National Governors Association pulled together with the Law Center. Of, uh, Class. Yeah. So uh, I'm not good with the acronyms. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, uh, parents and children uh, thriving together is packed. Uh, and it really is this, uh, I think, a, a, a legitimate effort at having a solution that is sufficiently malleable to work in a, a variety of states and a variety of circumstances to, to, to be successful in urban areas and, and, and suburban areas and rural areas as well, which is not easy to, to design. And I think it's going to be part of the solution. If you, if you step back from the 2016 election, and, and really look at, well, and look at the fact that, that the, the, the state is, or the country is so politically polarized, a huge part of that is a rural urban divide and just of immense proportions, probably as, 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 as challenging and as critical a divide as was before the Civil War. The, the, so many people in rural America feel that they have been left behind, that no one cared, and that they are, you know, they're, they're left to fend with themselves. And, Historically, the challenges we saw in the inner cities, broken families, drug use, now we're seeing those exact same challenges in very similar proportions in, across rural America. Uh, and I think the, you know, the challenge, uh, I think what, what parents and children thriving together offers is a framework by which we can begin to rebuild that, that trust and that relationship. And obviously, it's going to need a, more funding but as, as Reggie's done a great job of demonstrating in Colorado, and I think we'll, we'll work across the country, there are sufficient savings in so many of these programs. You've just got to be able to, to, to take out the, 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 the assessment, the, the period of time when you're measuring outcomes, uh, and be able to demonstrate 
you know, this is, this is what success means. And, and maybe they don't quite pay for themselves, but they come pretty darn close. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And this is one where uh, uh, working with lots of colleagues and partners, the Aspen Institute for, I think, about three years in a row has brought state teams together out to the Aspen campus with, uh, with statewide teams to, to really go deeper on this two gen and looking at children and parents together. So, um, and this model around what's the cost benefit, but really the benefit cost analysis, mm -hmm. short term and long term, I think is part of taking these proof points to the next level. So um, we'll look forward to having you come and help us on that, <laughs> continuing on. I'm going to close out with two um, more questions here, and then we're, I'm going to bring it to the audience because we have a phenomenal group of leaders here that um, I would uh, think they might have a, a question or two for you all. Um, but one, I want to talk about this piece about bridging communities because this, this, this polarization right now is, um, it's painful, no matter what side you're on. It's a really, um, and it can be everything from painful to highly distractive. And one of the things we think about uh, a lot at Aspen, and it was a huge reason for the um, creation of the Ascend Fellowship, both at the national and at the, the statewide level with our first model in Colorado, is we need leaders that we minimally thought who are able to talk across systems to one another. Just the early childhood vocabulary is different than the higher ed vocabulary, and they're both in the education lane. Um, now we sort of have increased that opportunity to find new ways to communicate. And you, you know, said perfectly well, the challenge is around narrative. You said, get rid of the word custodial. I'm not a father. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts from really a sort of a kind of a leadership question. What is, how do we lead across these divides if, you know, the North Star here today is children and family are thriving, um, you know, through and building the next generation. What are your kind of, um, your, your advice, your thoughts about bridging th these divides? Well, probably a good place to start would be for a lot of us leaders to shut up, right? And Why'd spend, you look at me when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> and spend a little more time, you know, reaching out and going to the other person's turf uh, and, and instead of explaining why they're wrong and maybe we think we're right, but, but really listen to what their concerns are and repeat. You know, I spent 15 years in the restaurant business, in the tavern business. I, I don't think there's a governor in America that's wa washed more pint glasses than I have. Uh, <laughs> but one thing you learn in the restaurant business is when someone's unhappy with you, when someone's really frustrated and angry, don't try to explain to them why they shouldn't be unhappy. Repeat back their exact words that they're saying to you and, 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 and really, and then ask a question about it, then repeat back a portion of what they've said to you, ask another question about it, and that that, that call and response is uh, people feel validated. They feel that you really care about what they're saying. They, they're hearing their words given more value by, because you're using them in that conversation with them. And as a starting point, I think that would go a long way. So, and we've been trying to do that in Colorado. The other thing is rural, the challenges in rural, Colorado and in rural America, the population is so thin, it makes it very hard to, to get resources distributed appropriately. But it also means that the costs aren't that high, right? So it does cost more per person, but I mean, you go out into Western Colorado, you go to a small town like Craig, Colorado, and you provide enough incentives so that the, uh, the clinic can, take, can, can cover everybody, and you provide enough incentives so you can create another 20 jobs uh, in that town, and you have moved the needle, right? And you don't have to, and, and, and all, all in, that's, you know, you're talking uh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're not talking millions and millions of dollars. And I think that's something that, that those of us who live in urban areas and, and the more economically successful parts of our states realize that we're going to have to make an investment uh, rebuilding that relationship with the rural parts of our states so that, once again, we begin thinking about ourselves as, as Americans. We're all Americans. Great words, great words. So last question here. I'm going to go one more time with the governor, and then we're going to go into the audience, and then we will be coming back. Don't worry, you're not off the hook. Um, <laughs> but one of the, um, and, and this has come out uh, throughout this whole conversation, and it's a core principle of the importance of work. And so actually Ascend has been asked to be a learning partner with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to help them. Um, we have an innova a national innovation initiative that is looking at really work, health and well-being, and the two-generation approach. 
and how do we think about what work is going to look like and what it, what's the new reimagination of parent and family work supports that are going to work for business and the economy and really work with families. And in the spirit of listening and engaging, as someone who's probably been more time in the social sector and the policy circle than in the business community, I think how do we really engage in, in a different level of meaningful conversations with the private sector, especially when we're thinking about this moment in time with we have the tax um, the tax you know, breaks that have gone out. We're sitting on sort of cash um, record levels. Like, how do we have the right incentivized conversation? What kind of thoughts would you have for um, us in terms of really moving the needle on meaningful work and really the right on ramps for families and parents? So, I think meaningful work is is always going to be a function. There are two parts of it. One is is training and, and education and skills, which I talked about already. I won't won't belabor that point up, but I think it's unimaginably important. I mean, it's it, it's it's. I mean, people talk about automation and software and technology and what's happening. I mean, we put in four major software systems in the state of Colorado. You know, hundred million dollars plus. And every time I go to Suman Nalapati, who's our our Secretary of Technology and Chief Information Officer, I say, well. So how many jobs am I saving now with that $112 million investment? Every time, we don't save any jobs, right? We can suddenly do a 1,000 times more for our citizens. We're, we're more transparent. We're faster. We're more, more effective in every way. But we end up having to hire more people to manage the software, right? And we're, and we're having to, to get people trained in different skills. So that's part of it. I think that's a big part of it. We have to also look at the laws that over the last 50 years, in terms of work and, and the middle class, I mean, we've got to look at, it, at at people just getting into the workforce or people that have been struggling at the bottom, but we also have to look at people that used to be in the middle of the workforce. And, you know, there's a, 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 a lot of people don't know this, but there's an economic limit. Uh, I think it's now $29,500 that if someone's getting paid a salary up to, I think it's $29,000, uh, then if, if they were, no matter what their title is, no matter what they do, if they work more than 40 hours, they get overtime. If they're getting paid less than 29000 that number hasn't changed in like 50 years, right? There's no, so in present day dollars, that should be $70,000, if, right? If we've been adjusting that as we should have. And if you think about it, just squint your eyes. And, you know, capitalism is what it is. But you look at uh, large companies and they have all these middle managers, right? And as that, that inflation takes people out of that, past that $29,000 bar barrier, employer after employer is going to say, well, I've got three managers here, and if they, or, or maybe I've even got four managers here, if three of them work 60 hours a week, I could do the work with just three people. And if I paid overtime, I could never do that. That would be crazy. But since now they're, they're all getting paid $34,000 a year, I can ask each one to work. I'll give them 38000 I might even give them $40,000 a year, and they're going to work 60 hours for the rest of their lives, right? That's not a successful transition into a, a middle class economy that anybody would want to live in. And, and yet, if you look at the number of, of middle class jobs that we've hollowed out through that kind of just not paying attention. And, and it, again, other, I know that probably half the room has been saying, well, what have you been, Hickenlooper? We were paying attention. <laughs> um, I mean, I heard about this several months ago for the first time, and I was, I was staggered that I'd never heard about it before. I was uh, the same way, you know, five years ago, one of our uh, constituents came in and gave me the statistic that 70% of our kids are never going to complete a four-year degree and that that's been roughly the same number for 30 years. I, I mean, what have we been thinking, right? At, at a certain, I mean, it's it, in a funny way, and I take my share of the responsibility, uh, we haven't delivered w w in many ways it was most needed. Wow. Um, well, I really appreciate those comments, and I'm going to I could keep going on. I have a million other questions, but I, we have such a great audience here. But I want to underscore both the boldness of, you know, just really putting out there, we know what, we know a lot. And now it's about really having the courage to go to the next level, some of which is unknown and it requires us to really step up in ways, um, whether it's different investments, different models, or different mindsets. So I actually think that was an incredibly powerful platform to invite the, um, the, the audience here. If you have a question or a comment, and what I would ask, um, we have roving mics, so a mic will come your way. If, um, you did, if we'd love for you to introduce yourself and um, ask your um, 
relatively concise question. <laughs> <laughs> so we go here and then over there. That's where we're supposed to tell them not to give a speech. Exactly. I was, trying, I was starting polite. Hi, my name's Tom Ramstad. Governor Hickenlooper, you've talked about some of the things that you've done so far as far as second generation. What's your next plan? What's the next step? So, I, I, you know, we are, have built, I think, a very good uh, business plan, essentially, about second generation. I think it's fair to, to say that. Uh, I've got, and I have a little, uh, in, my, in my cell phone, in my day timer, my calendar, I have a little counter. So I have 280 days left in, in, in this administration, in my term. Reggie has that same counter in he his. He does. <laughs> we all have it. We all take it. So he's got a work plan. We've all got a work plan. We're really focused on implementation. Now, in some places, we are looking at, uh, in terms of the, the intersection between uh, the acquisition of new skills and the supports that people need to be able to acquire those skills, uh, we're trying to create the business plan for that, because right now, that's not, that's not uh, uh, it hasn't been synchronized sufficiently into one vision. Uh, we're doing, we, we have a partnership with uh, Microsoft that allows people throughout their lives to look at keeping track of all the skills they acquire, and then at any one time they can click on various professions, uh, and the, the software will eventually, when it's, when it's, when it's uh, fully functional, will be able, they'll be able to see what skills they have, what skills they would need to get to that profession, and where they can get those skills and what it would cost. So tie that in with the, the apprenticeship program we're doing, which is apprenticeships not just in electrician and plumbing, but we do uh, you know, for, seven, for seven, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, apprenticeships that they can go work for a bank for a couple days and then study three days a week and learn a curriculum that helps them be more successful in the bank. We, we have several of these programs all to get, but they haven't been orchestrated. They haven't been synchronized. So, uh, and actually, that, the, the, the workforce, the uh, skillful.com, this technology platform, uh, last summer Microsoft gave us a $26 million grant, largest grant their foundation has given. Very, very exciting stuff, but it's kind of not connected yet. Uh, and so we're now working to, uh, I, I went on my own money. If, have you, I'm sure have you heard, if you've heard the soundtrack to Hamilton, the play, right? And there's that song, I'm not throwing away my shot. I'm not throwing away my, well, I as, a, as an individual, I own, MyShot.com, MyShot.org, MyShot.co. Because I, th I think at some point, yeah, I haven't told Reggie this. <laughs> but I think at some point, that's a possible arc by which we bring together all, you know, we're trying to encourage people to take responsibility for the acquisition of sk skills and responsibility for their career over the arc of their lifetime. You know, uh, calling it MyShot.com is not, a, not an impossible idea. Now, Lin-Manuel Miranda, just for the record, <laughs> you think it's impossible. I went to Wesleyan, Lynn went to Wesleyan. At some point, our paths are going to cross. And I, I, I don't think it's as far-fetched as some of your imaginations might lead you. Oh, my gosh. That is obviously our next convening. Of, like, my 17-year-old daughter will be signing up for it. That is like the song reverberating throughout our house. Fascinating. So, Reggie, I want to actually ask you to respond a little bit, too, because you're going to be on the to-do, and I know you have an active checklist, day count, and I know Gretchen Hammer, the Medicaid director from the great state of Colorado is also here too. Across your administration, it also goes down to that level. So anything you would add in as well? Mine is way boring compared to what the governor just <laughs> talked about, that's for sure. Uh, we're really working on sustaining the work that we've made and continuing to build across agencies. Uh, we have about 20 different uh, cabinet agencies across systems so that we can better communicate, better coordinate, better align our services to make it easier for Coloradans to get access to the services that we need, and that there's a true transition from government support to greater self-sufficiency across the landscape. Just one small example of something we've built, a, a program called PEAK, which is an online 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, source that anyone can go on to begin to apply for public assistance benefits. We built it off of the, uh, so with some funds from the Affordable Care Act as we looked at expanding Medicaid. It allowed us to, uh, it was one of those $100 million ones, Governor, but it allowed <laughs> us to rebuild a, a, a system for public eligibility that was woefully inadequate. Uh, but today, a Coloradan can go online because of cooperations between multiple state agencies. They can apply for Medicaid, which is in our healthcare policy and finance agency. 
They can apply for uh, food assistance or child care, which is in my agency. They can apply for uh, WIC, which is in our public health agency. They can apply for free and reduced lunch, which is in our Department of Education. It's those types of approaches to being more efficient, more effective in building our government systems up from the people so that they can experience experience us the way that they want to experience their they want us to experience their lives rather than having people have to figure out how to navigate local or state government to get the supports that they need. Those are the types of things that we're trying to continue to move forward in the last few hundred days we have in office. That's awesome. Um, back there, um, so let me get the go there. And the purple dress. If you want to stand just so you can help and then they'll know how to find you. Sorry. And then and then we'll go over there. Thank you. Uh, uh, th uh, thank you for bringing up peak, Reggie. I'm Rachel. I'm from Colorado. Hi, Governor Hickenlooper. Yeah. We see each other everywhere. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to point out, I had a different question, but I wanted to point out that um, peak, uh, the, the NGOs and the service providers like Family Intercultural Resource Center in Summit County, they help connect people in, mm -hmm. in need with peak. As well, so there are collaborations with the um, with the NGOs and the the civil society organizations too. Um, and I've actually had to use Peak and the services of of FERC, Family Intercultural Resource Center. But my question is a little bit different, um, it, uh, Governor Hickenlooper. If you could speak to um, how the how rural transportation needs and healthcare will be benef uh, benefited by the the newly the new electric vehicle infrastructure plan that the state has rolled out because there are health and um, connectivity benefits and I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, and there's a, there's the short term and the long term, right? In, in the short term, uh, and we used our uh, Volkswagen uh, diesel malfeasance money. The, in other words, the penalty that Volkswagen <laughs> had to pay for their corruption. Hope there are no Volkswagen dealers here. Uh, I believe in forgiveness. Um, but anyway, we're taking that money and building, and we partnered with uh, the other Western states. And so we are integrating a, a recharging framework for electric vehicles that will, you know, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah. We will all have our, our major uh, thoroughfares connected. Most of our terrain in the west, in the mountain west, is at a higher elevation. So we are at risk from airborne pollution at a higher rate. In other words, you have to take in more volumes of your lungs, pull in more volumes of 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 air to get the same amount of oxygen out. So if there's more particulates or other forms of pollution in that air, it, we're at higher risk. So. We have been really pushing, we have the highest, um, my Republican friends hate this, but as you know, I love it. it <laughs> we are, and what's great is of those 10 states I listed, eight of them are Republican governors, right? And in the end, you ask, and there's some great governors, Matt Mead, the governor of Wyoming, I think is a spectacular governor. You ask him, why did you sign up to, to put your, you know, to join this, this network of, for electric vehicles? And he may, gave the answer that any good government any good governor would say, says, I can't afford to be left behind. Uh, and, and this is the future. And because we're at a higher altitude and have greater risk, we are, we have the highest, um, this is part the Republicans hate, the, the highest uh, cash incentive. So if you buy an electric vehicle in Colorado, the state gives you $7,000, right? Yeah, exactly. You go buy one of those little inexpensive volts or, or, uh, uh, or a leaf, they, they need some new names, too, I think, personally. <laughs> Just none of my business. A leaf. I'm going to drive down and pick up my, my kids with my leaf. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the, 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 you, you take the, the, the federal subsidies and our subsidies and, and any kind of dealer discounted, and you can walk away with a new electric vehicle with, you know, for fourteen or $15,000. That's an amazing situation. And I think down the road, so that's short term. We're going to be cleaning our air fairly rapidly. I think this is going to happen. The, the, having those, that network in place is going to uh, make it quicker. But uh, also, I mean, autonomous vehicles are, whether we like it or not, and there's going to be some bumps on the road, and we're going to have accidents, but it, it is highly probable that electric vehicles will, be, will become autonomous faster. And this is not just because of Elon Musk and Tesla, but it will become autonomous and allow us to 
connect people, especially in, in remote areas, much less expensively than, than we ever would be able to do otherwise. And so with you know, transit, so a lot of our mountain communities, uh, they're using electric vehicles now for their buses and their, you know, their connectivity between communities and, and getting people to healthcare. But down the road, and I don't think this is 20 years down the road, I think it's you know, eight or 10 years down the road, we're probably gonna see, um, we're gonna see autonomous vehicles uh, and probably first more commonly in rural parts of the, of the state to do that kind of, that kind of connectivity. Um, you know, it's a funny thing I'll just throw in because <clears throat> I think it's interesting. Uh, when they first built, you know, skyscrapers and they had steel, they could, could actually support these large, tall buildings. The, the height limit was based on how far people were willing to go up steps every day. So all of a sudden they invented the elevator in 1880, 1885. The first elevators were, were they used to call them child killers. And then the elevators wouldn't stop at the right floor. You'd get in and start going up. People would get caught. People, I mean, horrible, bloody, gory stories. Uh, I won't repeat it so close before dinner. But, <laughs> but by about 19, 1898 or 1899, they finally got to the point where, and, and they, put, they, they got them to stop at the right things. They got them to the point where you didn't have to have an operator. At that, up until that point, they had to have an operator. No one would get in them. So they had the, these, these essentially autonomous elevators. And no one would get into them because of the stories and what they'd heard and what they'd experienced, they just didn't feel safe. So they went all the way until 1949. So they had the technology to have elevators run by themselves, and yet every skyscraper, every elevator had an elevator operator. And it wasn't until a large strike by the union of elevator operators in New York City in 1949 that the, the building owners no one had ever told them that they had the capacity for <laughs> autonomous elevators. And they went to every, all their people and said, hey, we're going to lower your rent this little bit, and, and we want to bring in these, these autonomous elevators so that we can break this strike. And kaboom, all of a sudden people said, well, I guess an automatic elevator is OK. Uh, but it might be a while before we get autonomous vehicles. That, yeah. you know. That's awesome. And over there, thank you, Governor. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Candace Driscoll. I work for the DC Department of Human Services. Um, you both talked about in the conversation how jobs are an important way to eliminate poverty. And um, I would argue that no matter how educated, talented, and well-connected you are, many of us are not insulated from a job loss. And when living in the condition of poverty, that can be pretty devastating um, for a family. So my question is, have you guys thought about the role of building wealth, um, particularly for families of color, in eliminating poverty. That's great. Right, ready. Uh, absolutely. Um, it, <clears throat> we didn't get into this today. There's a ton of things I'd love to, to do if we could change the system. Because I think the way that uh, our system is built in America has been about those who have and those who don't have, and not about a transition of what life is really like, a journey of moving from one economic class to the other. And we run into things from time to time that may bounce us back into uh, poverty. Uh, but if we could help folks to, one of the things that I would love to change is figure out ways that we could build a system that is about helping people to develop wealth. I've always wondered why we say for people in the middle class and the upper middle class, you can see these commercials and they're always talking about how you're gonna build your wealth. But for people who are struggling with poverty, we don't think and we don't use those same terms in that way. Despite the fact that if folks begin to uh, attain wealth, when they have those shortfalls, they lose that job. They have only 280 days left in office and there's no place else to go. <laughs> you have a base with which you can use to sustain you until you can, until you can move on to the next thing. Some of the things that we've done in Colorado to help with that is uh, we've reduced or eliminated asset uh, limits wherever we can. It doesn't make sense to me that uh, if I've lost my job, I have to sell my car or move out of my house before I can get some public assistance that will help me get back on my feet again. So we've reduced and eliminated asset limits. Uh, we're talking about with philanthropic partners uh, about how we can engage families to get connected to a savings account. Uh, can begin to put to learn about financial uh, literacy and how to begin saving uh, in their home. These types of approaches, I think, are absolutely critical to help people not just get out of poverty, 
wants, but to give them the skills and resources that they need to self-sustain as they move forward. And we ought to change our, here's another one, Governor, can't we change the language of saying we're gonna move out of poverty to we are going to help all Americans create wealth. Yeah. Right, and, and I think just to throw on that, and, and this would require an investment of government resources, a, 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 an increase, but these cliffs that you hear about, that uh, it, when, it, when, it, when a person is you know, working their way out of poverty and getting raises, and then suddenly they hit that point, and they're going to lose their, they're going to lose their Medicaid, they're going to lose their, their food, whatever. There's all these cliffs that are kind of coming along. It, it, it needs to all be gradual. There should never be a disincentive for someone not to want to achieve more. And I, I, you know, we'll get to that. And then the other thing I'll just say in terms of for young people, I mean, how this country allowed the largest debtor community to be our kids as a result of college is, is, is a sacrilege. And the kids, my, my executive assistant, who is about, about turned 40, just had her second child. She was, had a child when she was 20. And she would take school loans, and she had a kid, and her husband was a musician, and you know, I don't, you don't need all the details. But she took some loans. She got, ended up getting a master's in, in photojournalism, right? And she's not stupid. I mean, she's a, 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 a sensible kid, but her parents weren't involved in, in any of these decisions. So she has, to this day, $70,000 in debt. She's, she's, she's 40 years old. And, and she, you know, was making, able to make interest-only payments. And we, you know, when we first hired her, Roxanne was my chief of staff, uh, she'd been working as a, uh, as in an early childhood education center, and she was losing ground. She only had to pay a certain amount of interest because it's a, limited to a percentage of your income, but they add what you're not paying onto the, onto the corpus. So that's how she went from $58,000 down to $70,000. I mean, who is this benefiting? And some well-intentioned congressional delegation, or, or, or one, one, a, a Congress, I guess one calls it, uh, decided that, that, that this, that there was a specific Congress that decided this is a good idea. We'll let this be this. The, this is the one form of debt in America where you can never declare bankruptcy. We'll give you all the money you want. I mean, we might as well legalize heroin at the same time, right? I mean, think about it. You, you, you can never walk away from it no matter how destitute your life becomes. So um, I'm watching the clock, and what I'd love for everybody is raise your hand if you have a question, because what um, we also are going to have a wonderful reception after this, so there's time for some informal um, visiting, and the governor and Reggie um, and other members of the team are going to be here. But I'd love to just get some of the popcorn questions across and take it in and sort of incorporate what you would like to in your kind of closing thought with my also question peppered in. Um, uh, <laughs> but then there'll also be time for a visit. And I'd love just to, so again, um, your name and where you're from and your um, concise question. So we'll start. Um, just raise your hand. Don't be shy here. We're Aspen. Don't give up your shot. Um, <laughs> and uh, my team will roll. Thanks, Veronica. So we'll start with you. Hello. My electric vehicle is a thunderbolt. Ah. But, uh, <laughs> I'm Steve Hernandez. I'm the executive director of the Commission on Women, Children, and Seniors in the state of Connecticut. We're part of the legislature. You know, what's really cool, we've been admiring uh, Colorado from afar for a long time now. But what's interesting is that in Connecticut, while we are leading in some respects in 2Gen, we still have a real trouble bringing together the public and the private sector. And not only that, but also innovating our existing initiatives and institutions so that they see themselves as part of the two-gen fabric. We have a vibrant uh, fatherhood initiative, which is now struggling uh, because cuts to fatherhood initiatives have been across the board. But if they saw themselves as part of that two-generational initiative the way you're doing in Colorado, I think it would bring new vibrancy to the way that we work across agencies and silos and across budgets in more efi efficient ways. So this is really exciting. I'm glad it's the beginning of a conversation because we, I want to learn more about how you're bringing this together. We have a bill now in our legislature that I will lead if it passes on bringing the public and private sector and the provision of human services in our state. So we're starting that conversation. And it's really exciting that you're so far ahead. That's great. OK. Wait, wait, keep, no. Well, quickly, quickly, sure. 
Quickly, quickly, go. One of the things that we've been very fortunate is a strong philanthropic community who knows this, understands this. And so they have also been a bridge between the public sector and the private sector. Folks like Letty Bass, who is with Chambers Family Fund, or Elsa Holguin with the Rose Community Foundation, and so many other leaders in this early childhood space who've been able to say, this is where we're going with our philanthropic dollars. Government, uh, with the leadership of Governor Hickenlooper and Rocks and others uh, moving that Roger, way. That's long that's, enough. You gotta get all these questions. You can't keep talking. You said short. Did I just? You I said just short. I'm trying to solve the problems of I Connecticut, boss. That's why we have a reception. Governor Goodness. Malloy, thanks you. <laughs> Moving right over there. And again. Hi, I'm Catherine Bean with YWCA USA, um, and I'm from the nonprofit sector. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, in addition to public-private partnership the nonprofits may have played a role or could play a role. Most of our local associations across 47 states struggle with having enough dollars to do the, um, the evidence-based demonstration of outcomes uh, just because of resources. Any thoughts you might have on either how they've been involved in Colorado or how they could be in the future would be great. Fantastic. Nonprofits, evidence-based, limited funding. The gentleman over here, Eddie, can you look? We're just going to hop. Everybody's great. Thank you, Eddie. And be, don't be shy with your hand. OK, years ago, I was on a commission that Hillary Clinton headed called Skills of the American Workforce. And we talked about exactly about this. If you don't have high skills, you're going to have low wages. We visited Sweden. And one of the things they did that I thought was very intelligent was that if you were unemployed, you got unemployment compensation for a few weeks. But after a few weeks, if you didn't have a job, your unemployment continuing Unemployment compensation continuing was contingent on your going to school and learning a skill for which the, the government believed there were jobs. Great. Why don't we think about some, you know, we have a lot of carrots, but some sticks for requiring people to, to take responsibility for their own education and their own workforce development. Oh, gosh, such a good one. Another conversation. Gentleman behind you, <laughs> and then we'll go over to Sharon in the green. Uh, my name is Mark, Mark Silverman. Um, the comment from Connecticut um, uh, caused me to decide to ask this question, and that is, you've talked. We talked all about Connecticut. You've alluded to other jurisdictions. Um, what kind of coordination is there, whether through the governors' um, uh, conferences or regional, to get what you guys have done to other jurisdictions? and vice versa, because I don't hear a lot about how you guys are working together to make what you've done um, uh, adapted in other places. Okay. Uh, great question. One plug while you go back. Actually, Eddie, if you don't mind getting the, um, the gentlewoman behind. Um, actually, we'll talk a little bit at the end. Ascend actually has a national network working on that with um, about 200 organizations. So great question. Love you for that. Hi, uh, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist. I'm also on the board of governors of the Labor and Employment Relations Association. It's a national organization. We talked about two gen, but how about three gen? Seniors are living longer. Grandparents often raise younger people. People are needing jobs. We know that seniors are often impoverished. I'd like you to think about that and see how you can weave that into your concerns. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then Sharon, and then we'll hit those really quickly back there. I'm really trying to be equitable. We're so inclusive here. OK. Hi, Sharon McRoder, um, most recently with the National Governors Association. And I want to hear what you all are doing in Colorado or what vision you have for the future, whether it's in your tenure or not, but regarding mental health services yeah. and a two-gen approach. And I mean broadly where you, know, you think about if there's mental health issues or behavioral issues with the children or you know, the adults to keep a job um, and they don't have access to even an employee assistance program or family counseling. You know, these are the kinds of things that can also derail both a child's educational uh, progress and the adult. So right. mental, health. mental health. Not mental health. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm um, just quickly, super quick. Hi, Amanda Newman here at the Aspen Institute and a fellow cardinal. I wanted to ask very quickly um, about the role of business in supporting thriving families, um, particularly in traditionally uh, or historically low wage um, occupations and, and sectors, and how you might be addressing this. Okay, super, great. And gentlemen back there, guest stand, help, help Veronica out here. She's rolling. 
Hi, Patrick Dolan with the Center for American Progress. Nice to see you, Governor. My question for you is related to um, overtime. So I think, as you know, states are not precluded from expanding overtime protections. And uh, recently, Governor Wolf in Pennsylvania expanded overtime through an executive order. So my question for you is, uh, in your remaining time in office, when should we expect to see an executive order on overtime? Yeah. Excellent. Um, OK. Hi, um, Christy Arnold, Executive Di Director with Lyft DC. Hey. hey. Um, so I actually wanted to ask a question regarding the financial education piece. So at Lyft, we do financial and career coaching with um, parents, and we're big on the two-generation work as well. And I'm wondering if you all are doing any financial literacy or education with children um, and teaching them at a very young age about saving and investing. It kind of gets to the young lady's point earlier about wealth and just even planting that seed and teaching that at a very young age, particularly with children in underserved communities where they may not necessarily get that conversation at the dinner table with their parents. Um, just wanted to know about that. That's fantastic. OK, super quickly. Thanks. Um, Patty Cole with Zero to Three, and I actually want to thank you for your support uh, for a wonderful two-gen program that we're associated with um, in Colorado is um, the Healthy Steps program, which embeds child development specialists in pediatric offices so that parents have access to um, help in nurturing their children and also connecting with social services. And so my question is really about um, how is Colorado really focusing more on uh, the youngest children when learning starts at birth? And also, to save your loss for answers, our conf annual conference is going to be in Denver in October, and we hope you'll join us there. Awesome. OK, very last one, the wonderful woman in the corner there. Thank you for being patient. And um, we will move into wrap up. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Danielle Adamson. I work with the National Black Child Development Institute with one of our affiliates being in the great city of Denver. Um, my question was about educational disparity. I know that um, during this particular conversation there was mentioned that um, there is an achievement gap between um, African American and Latino students and their Caucasian counterparts. And so my question is, what is the state of Colorado doing in order to address that educational disparity? Great. OK, so that's a lot. So just to help you two wonderful um, leaders out, here are some of the things you could weave into your closing, <laughs> short, inspirational, motivational, concise, and quotable closing comments. Um, we've got the role of business um, over time and potentially the use of um, best use of executive orders um, moving forward. Thinking about the intersection of unemployment and education and global models as well as some other local models that are getting at that. There's some great opportunities around that. How do we think about we want to be building with evidence, going with results? How do also some of those social innovations, how are they able to fund that? Um, thinking of financial education. Uh, the achievement gap, also really putting a fine sort of thinking about the disparities around race, ethnicity, and income. Uh, obviously, about mental health and how to weave that in. And then also getting to families at the very earliest uh, years. So as you step back and think about all of these incredibly insightful questions and all these partners that are in this room and all the poor people from Mississippi and Hawaii who we just totally ignored, aloha. Forgive us. We will keep working with you. Um, but you all are leaving a very powerful legacy. People are watching. And there's a few simple things we know in life. There's nothing like success to beget success and nothing like hope to help people go further and do what they think they can't do. And so Colorado, where we started, was what would it take for Colorado to be the best state to have and raise a child, build a family, have the strongest cross-sector systems that started from the very beginning on up and was great for business and democracy and civil society. So I'd love to just, your sort of last thoughts and words, and this won't be the only time, this is an ongoing conversation. This is sort of why Ascend exists here at the Aspen Institute. But I'd love to um, really have you put that out there and know there'll be more conversation. And I love the nature of the questions, because this work is there is a cohort of states. We do need to get you know, smarter and faster about accelerating this. Um, so I'm going to start first with you, Reggie, and then go with the governor. And then I'm going to close out with Martin Luther King. 
Very briefly, thank you to the governor uh, for the opportunity to serve the state of Colorado. It's, it's been a privilege the last seven years, and um, we need to step on the gas the last 280 days. Thank you to the uh, Ascend at the Aspen Institute. Uh, when the governor asked me to come and take this job, he gave me a big challenge, and I said, I'm going to do it. And then I went back to my office and said, I don't know how the hell I'm going to do that. And Ascend reached out and said, uh, we've got a framework and an idea, and we'd like to partner with you. So thank you for uh, all that you've done for us in Colorado and across the country. Uh, I will be very brief to say on every one of the questions that you had, what 2Gen does, even if we consider 2Gen broadly to include 3Gen, it's about kids and families together. And it's a framework that allows us to talk and think about all of those experiences, whether it be uh, racial challenges that divide us, whether it be mental health or substance abuse issues that are challenges, uh, domestic violence, whatever might be occurring within the family that we're working with. Thinking differently about our solutions rather than thinking just about the one person that's in front of me and helping them with whatever they're experiencing, thinking about them within a family system and developing solutions and challenges that doesn't change the work that we do, it changes the way that we do the work. If you take anything away, I hope that's what you take away today. Thank you so much, Reggie. Okay. Governor Hickenlooper. See, he's so much better than I am at this. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go down my list. Um, in terms of public-private partnerships, it's putting things in a framework where it's accessible, that both sides have a self-interest in succeeding. One home, one congregation, when we were doing our homeless stuff, where we reached out to, there were, uh, at that time, there were 950 congregations in metropolitan Denver. There were about 1,100 homeless families, mostly single moms, with, with single parents with one, two, three kids. And congregations signed up, and they would put up the first month's rent and the last month's rent. And they would, they would provide four to six mentors for six months to a year to help that single parent, A, get reemployed, get through the crisis that generally created the homelessness, and then support them ongoing. Unbelievably successful. We've now uh, tackled over, I think, we've, we've had over 5,000 mentors and uh, 4,500 homeless uh, individuals that have uh, been housed, and the recidivism of them going homeless again is a half of what it is without that, that support. And it's government convening, but getting out of the way. And I think those kinds of things, we got private businesses to fund it because it made, made sense. Uh, and the, the, where's the YWCA right here? I mean, why is it, you guys don't sell yourselves hard enough, right? I, no, I'm serious. And I'm sure you think you are, and I'm probably going to get scolded later. But, <laughs> but I have a, a couple of friends uh, connected to, to YWCA uh, in, in Colorado. And there's got to be a, 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 a business benefit for businesses to write their checks. And you got to show what's in it for them. And it's got to be, I don't want to demean any of the business people here, but it's got to be pretty simple, right? <laughs> um, the, the Sweden story about Hillary, when, when, you know, I got interviewed to be a potential VEEP for Hillary and I told her about our apprenticeship. And we're, we took 55 people to Switzerland. We had six, the CEOs of the six largest foundations that had a higher education, that had K-12 education. We had six superintendents of schools. We took all the thought leaders, and we all spent a week. It's the only time in public service I spent a whole week doing one thing. We leave the hotel at 7. We get back at 8 at night. It was transformative. Uh, when I talked to Hillary about it, she knew all about it. She knew, every, she knew the difference between Sweden and Switzerland and Germany and which ones give you freedom. Uh, I mean, so in terms of, certainly in terms of that training, if not everything else, we, we, we took a gamble when we elected Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the, the, the notion of, of providing, forcing, and compelling people that if they're going to keep getting unemployment benefits, that they have to do some level of training, that's just an idea waiting to be in the right context. And I think R's and D's, I think both sides would, would embrace it. People have to take responsibility for trying to help themselves. And, uh, everyone buys into that. Uh, the question about governments training each other, that's a, the, the National Governors Association does a pretty darn good job, not perfect. They have over 100 people in their best practices center trying to get the, stuff, the work that gets done here around 2Gen and figuring out how do we put it in a way to uh, get it to other, to other states. The stuff I talked about with uh, uh, the Markle Foundation and Skillful.com, there are now 20 states that are taking what we, all the mistakes we've made and they're going to improve them dramatically. Three generate, three, the, why not a three gen for seniors? That is such a real question. And I have an old friend who's now 68 years old. She doesn't have enough money to really retire. I've been trying to help her find a job for four years. And she was the head of human resources at a large company. You know, she's got a limp. 
She, she's had knee problems. Uh, and, and I've got some influence, right? Lots of people are, <laughs> well, but I'm, but I'm not willing to go out and tell one of my cabinet members, you've got to hire this person. But uh, there is such a bias against hiring someone who is at the end of their career uh, versus hiring somebody that, that's young. And I think the only way it's going to happen is through incentives of some sort. But we, we have to do it because there are so many seniors who don't have enough resources to retire in any, in any kind of comfort. Mental health. I mean, we, when, after we had the shootings in Aurora, the first thing we did, before we did universal background checks for gun safety, we did $30 million a year to mental health. And we continue to push it. Uh, we have a high rate of suicide. I mean, all the, the, the measurements you can look at to gauge how well you're doing mental health, across the country, we're losing. Uh, and we're seeing that not just in the mass shootings, but in all the little, in all the little places. Um, the, lo the role of business in, I can't read my own handwriting, addressing, addressing? I can't, I'm gonna lose that one. Um, why not have, in, ter in terms of the, uh, why am I not gonna do an executive order in terms of the raising the, the, uh, the where, you can, where you have to get overtime? Uh, in Colorado, I can't do that. We have to have, that's in statute. And right now I have a Republican Senate and they have been very, uh, uh, thoughtful, I don't want to, do we've got four more weeks of session, so I don't want to piss anybody off, but this, <laughs> it, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, financial, <laughs> finan well, I, I think people are going to get frustrated of the types of votes. I mean, we couldn't even get bump stocks banned in Colorado. We're a pretty progressive state in a lot of things like that. We have universal background checks. We have limited magazine sizes. Uh, uh, financial literacy, what we have is, is, like many states, we have junior achievement, volunteer groups like that, uh, not sufficient. But the cost, we have estimates of taking what that would look like to put that and begin to scale that through public schools. Most people think it would, should be in middle school, maybe the beginning of high school. Um, very difficult. And then the same thing with the notion and recognition that you know, when a child is born and, and those early years, how rapidly their brain's growing, why aren't we doing more in those years? Uh, the cost, Colorado does not have full day kindergarten yet, right? We've got three quarters of the state is, willing, is paying the money and doing it, but uh, you know, a little bit more than a quarter still doesn't have full day kindergarten. So uh, state by state by state, there's just a, an awful lot of people. And again, this is another one of these divides where Many people don't believe that that's real science and, and that those years, they think having the kid at home playing around with their kitchen utensils or you know, uh, watching educational TV, that that's, that's sufficient to help that mind grow at the rate at which it needs to. Uh, and then last, the educational disparity. I think I got all of them. There's one I couldn't read my handwriting. The <laughs> educational disparity, and I get, you know, someone said to me a, a couple months ago, and I've been really trying to think through this, We've had a tremendous amount of time in this country now getting more money to support poor people of any sort. And there is real education disparity and, and, and clear uh, you know, inequality in terms of the, the, the places where we have government systems to try and raise people up out of poverty. Uh, and there is real disparity between Latinos and African Americans uh, and, and, uh, and, and whites. One of the, the, what this person said to me is, if we ta stop talking about it quite so much at that level and looked at just helping all poor people, their opinion was that we'd get a lot more money coming into it and Latinos and African Americans would end up with a net increase in revenue, even though we weren't talking about the, the disparity between who gets how much. I don't know if that's true, but I th certainly think it's worth thinking about because I heard again and again even in, in, in the city and county of Denver, people feeling resentful that one class or another is getting more, more from government than they are. And again, I don't know how to disprove that. I don't think it's true. But that is a prevailing sentiment that I hear again and again. When, when I am able to get people to kind of open up and say what's really on their minds, that's, that's something that comes out. They think you know, too many individuals are getting more than what they get. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, that was an incredible going down the list. And so I think as we... Um, Seven minutes. Uh, well done, both of you. And what I, I want to just... Clearly, there's no shortage on uh, passion, focus, um, 
big picture and also keep the eye on the prize with the details about how this comes together. And I think you know the opportunity when we look at Colorado, we just went through a lot of specific issues. But if you pull back and you think about the past eight years, Governor and Director Bika, and you look at where you are with employment, you look at where you are with health, you look at where you are with collaboration, and sort of changing the conversation to bringing everybody together to say, what does it mean to create this intergenerational cycle of opportunity for children, parents, broader families to come together and put be at the center it is an incredibly powerful opportunity. And I just, um, I want to sort of, we here at Aspen think a lot about our history as well as our future. And you know, I can't help but think about, and one of, we do a lot of text-based readings, and um, a letter from Birmingham City Jail is a classic sort of, you can't work at the Aspen Institute and not sort of go back to that on a regular basis and think about what is your own letter you would write and what is the world you operate in. And so I just, um, you know, with the anniversary of the incredibly tragic and unjust loss of um, Dr. King just uh, yesterday, I want to sort of just bring him into the room for this moment in country and thinking about um, Brian Stevenson, who's the Equal Justice Initiative um, leader and also a good friend of the Aspen Institute, talks about um, justice as the, uh, the positive side of poverty. And we're really talking about opportunity for all. Mm -hmm. And when we think about that, and we think about how important leadership is, and the leadership that's coming up from local communities and states, and I just, I really cannot tip our collective Aspen hat enough to Colorado. But I think about Dr. King's words that say, when we think about leadership, that the ultimate measure of a person is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, when the economy is good or bad. He didn't have that part. Um, but he said it is in times of challenge and controversy. He went on to also say a genuine leader is not in searcher for consensus. She is a molder of consensus. We need to forge the new way. And lastly, when we think about there's no us, there's no them. It's all children, all families. And we talked about that bridging piece. I would encourage us all, all of you are leaders in this room of institutions, communities, families, and businesses. But that he said even more, most powerfully, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We all must listen, we all must love, and we all must be in the game. So our, one of our favorite um, partners and funders here is the Bezos family. And I'm going to have to write them right away if they're not tuned in. When we think about don't give away, I'm not going to give away my shot. They're always thinking about the moon shot. You know? So this is really about the moon shot meets my shot so that all children and families can reach their full potential. Governor Hickenlooper, on behalf of the Aspen Institute, we thank you so much for your leadership, your partnership, and for making the time to spend the afternoon with us. Director Bika, we'll be working with you on the 280-day list following up on this. <laughs> but truly, you have been a transformative force for the field of human services to really become the field of human potential and also for the children and families of Colorado. So a partnership like this, the great Roxanne White, our innovator, also Lindsay, Sarah, Lori, um, Marjorie, Mari, and Veronica, Eddie, you've seen everybody running, Lori, running throughout this room to make this day happen. Thank you all. We'll be in the reception area for a toast to Colorado and some great informal networking. Thank you.